Emily. Em- Ashley. Emily Schrader. Emily Schrader. That's right. it right. <laughs> um, also known as Emily in Tel Aviv. Correct. Which I'm assuming came after Emily in Paris, right? So it's like a new Actually, account. No. Oh, no. I had it first. I was very upset that they uh, that they did Emily in Paris. Should have copyrighted it. Right? Wow. Okay. That's. I, I actually was first, but I guess it's not that original, you know. Emily in X City. I don't know. I, I, I felt <laughs> like it was original. I know. I, I feel, they for sure copied you. Someone there for sure follows you and they for sure copied I I'd like to think so. I mean, the name Emily, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I, yeah, I thought it came after because it just made sense to me. But so that means you've been doing this for a lot longer than I thought. Yeah. I mean, I've been in the activism field for many years now, I guess over 10 years. Okay. So take us. Since for, I was 12. Since you were. Okay. So I'm no, not going to, I'm not going to ask you how old you are now. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but let take us back just a little bit, a little bit um, from the beginning for those who obviously don't know. Just in a few sentences, who are you and what do you do? Uh, so my name is Emily Schrader, as you stated. Uh, I'm a journalist. I'm an activist. I work with uh, Ynet. I also work with uh, VOA Farsi and a lot of other publications as well. Um, I do a bit of broadcasting. I do a bit of print. So I do everything. Uh, my background is actually in activism. I worked for one of the major pro-Israel organizations as the head of their digital department for eight years. And then I left to start my own digital marketing company. So that, in addition to all the other things, is what I'm what I'm doing now. And uh, lately, the last uh, few years in particular, I've been very focused on women's issues covering across the world, from Afghanistan to Iran to even here in Israel, the issues that we face. Uh, so that's sort of my area of uh, of focus. So, ha- okay. So, and you grew up in the United States, right? Correct? Yes. I'm an Ola Chadasha. I made Aliyah almost 10 years ago, nine years ago. But so Philadelphia, uh, if I remember correctly? Nope. Los Angeles. Los Angeles. A okay. bit further. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, how old were you when you made Aliyah? Uh, I was 22. Okay. So I was 21. So similar. Mm-hmm. And what, what, brought you to make Aliyah? Well, I actually, I did my master's degree also in Israel before that. And I came to Israel and I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to love it. I'm going to love it. And of course, it's very difficult, as you know, as an Ola yourself. And after grad school, I was like, no way I'm ever going to live here. I'm moving back. Zeu chalas nim asli. Then I got back to LA and I was bored. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's in Israel, it's different. Things have different uh, meaning. And um, after, I think it was Tsuketan in, in 2014, mm-hmm. because I was involved in Hasbara and Israel advocacy um, and, you know, the fight against anti-Semitism in particular online. So I started to not be satisfied with my life in L.A. And uh, the company that I worked for, the pro organization, they actually asked me to be based out of their Israel office. Oh, so, so you were working in L.A. doing it? Yeah, yeah. I was working was for Stan with, with us? Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, in L.A. Okay. okay and then sense. I made Aliyah, and I worked out of their office here for a while, and then, then I left to make my own okay, company. Okay, I understand. So, okay. When I grew up, I was, I was raised in a former Israeli home, um, which me, that's why my Hebrew is better than yours. Let's be, it's not because I'm like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I always, people are always like, your Hebrew is so good. I'm like, yeah, I grew up in a home speaking Hebrew. Your Hebrew is amazing. Yeah. I I'm mean, very I, envious. Yeah, I grew up <laughs> speaking Hebrew. So um, when I came, I didn't speak like I do now, but it came like really quickly because I had heard it at home. Um, but I grew up in a home where there was a huge love for Israel, but there was also a lot of like criticism about Israel and you know my, my father left because he was injured in the in the Yom Kippur war and he had PTSD and all those kind of things and when I grew up I went to a Jewish school did you grow did you go to a Jewish day school I didn't go to a Jewish day school I had a really weird childhood actually I was a figure skater but we'll get into that in a minute oh <laughs> nice I, I played hockey oh really well yeah. you're Canadian yeah, I know you have to do one or the I, other or you're not a real Canadian I know figure skating in LA that's probably very unique yeah okay. yeah it was I actually ended up training in Colorado okay so I guess that's not as unique okay but um but yeah okay so uh, so aside from being in a Jewish school I personally never really felt this huge connection to like my roots Okay, and as a child, when we used to come here to visit and like, you know, my my grandparents lived here and my aunts and uncles, like I liked to come to visit my family. There were certain aspects that were fun, 
but I didn't really love Israel as a child. And it was only when I was in uh, university in Canada that I actually started, you know, I went on Taglit and then I only, st I, that's when I started to realize, wait, hold on, there's some kind of like media bias against Israel and oh, that's not exactly accurate what they're saying on my campus right now. And that's how I got into being passionate about activism. How, what, how did you? That's actually really, really similar to my, okay. <laughs> to my experience. Right. I grew up nominally pro-Israel. Everyone in my family like supported Israel for both political, religious, whatever, many different reasons. But only when I got to university and I saw Apartheid Week yeah. <laughs> was I like, what is wrong with these people? Like, why are they? And in my case, they were all white kids. It wasn't even Arab students. All white kids at USC, which is like a school that's kind of like snobby, you know. I got into, so, I was accepted to USC, but I'm ah, not going. That's a funny story. Well, that's a shame. Yeah. <laughs> Could have <laughs> met back then. But yeah, they had their, their apartheid week display in the middle of campus. And I remember I turned to my friend and I was like, why are these people so obsessed with Jews? Like, what is their, what is their deal? And she, who was also Jewish, was like, well, you know, if you care so much, why don't you join the students for Israel? And at the time I was like, oh, no way. I'm way too busy and I don't have time for this. I have too many projects. And literally the next week I was on the board. So, yeah. <laughs> and so it begins and wow. Uh, continues. Wow. Okay. So this, it's funny because we do have a very similar story. For me, it was like the apartheid wall that they actually brought. Yeah, same. The campus, it was right? the actual wall. And for me, it was a month after I came back from Taglit where I had just seen that wall. And I was like, wait, uh, that's not that's not the story. I was just there, and so it's it's crazy how it's very similar. Yeah. Um, okay. So you were so you got involved with activism on campus, um, and then came here to do your second degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then went back. Was bored. Makes sense. I get yeah. it. Because I was in. I mean, I was a political science major. I worked on political campaigns in California for even until I made Aliyah. I actually quit presidential campaign in order to move to Israel because I was just I, ca I can't I can't really? I couldn't handle it anymore in the U.S. Because the priorities are like they don't realize that they don't actually have problems, <laughs> and so it became very difficult after having lived in Israel, working in at the time in the in government. And listening to people speak about like, well, the line to pick up my kids is so long and, you know, the city really has to fix this. And I'm just looking at these people. This was the same time of like the height of the Syrian civil war. Yeah. I mean, there are Syrian children who were literally just gassed by their own president. And, and these people are telling me like, oh, it's just such, life is so difficult because yeah. we have to wait an extra 20 minutes. And I, I just couldn't. And I remember that distinctly in that meeting because I was like, I have to make Aliyah. I can't, are, are you I can't a Libra? By any chance? I'm not. I'm a Taurus. You're a Taurus. Yeah. Okay. I'm a Libra and like Libras all about, are all about justice. And so like I, I feel that like whenever I hear people complain about things that like you aren't said, problems. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I remember I remember um, one of the things I say, you know, I'm sure you got this question so many times when you made Aliyah. Like I came, I did the army and in the army, everybody was like, what? You have a Canadian passport? Why are Why you, you here? Why are you here? Right. Um, and I was always explaining, like trying to explain, like, first of all, you know, the connection to the land and all that, but like, you know, you, sometimes you want to talk to people your own age when they're 21, like in, in terms that they're going to understand. It's not like, oh, it's so important because after 2000 years, we can finally live in our country, <laughs> right? Like that doesn't, they don't relate. Yeah. So I used to say to them, like, when you, life is so boring in Canada. I love it. It's great. It's, it's like utopia, right? But like, it's so boring that if you open the front page news of like the CBC, it's literally like... School in Ontario bans balls from squir from schoolyard <laughs> because kid got hit and had a concussion. Like that's front page news, and and here there's like action. Like there's always things going on. And as much as we complain about so many things about daily life in Israel, I think it's what makes it also in some weird masochistic way like fun to live here. Yeah, I mean it gives it meaning. It right. gives it gives it purpose. And I also think it's. I, I actually don't know if it's easier. In fact, it might be harder. But I felt that I'm able to understand better what's happening on both sides uh, and provide like more accurate information as to what's happening because I'm closer to what's happening. Right. It's very difficult, especially um, in L.A. Maybe on the East Coast, it's a little bit different because the time zone wise, they're just closer. But I remember during the operation in 2014, while I was working with Stand With Us, I, I had like conference calls at like two, three, four, five in the morning. And it, it just 
everybody in LA is so completely removed from what's actually happening on the ground. And it's very, very difficult. But here you have a different, uh, you have different pluses and different minuses. Absolutely. So it's, Absolutely. A, it's an ongoing challenge. So I'm curious to know, has your, um, we're not going to get into politics, but has your political ideology changed or evolved since you've made Elia? Because mine has. This is actually a good question for me uh, that I can answer without being political in regards to the, the current right. issues. Um, in short, they haven't changed, uh, but I'm more passionate about certain aspects of it than I used to be. Um, and one of them is women's issues. Uh, because it's just a different mentality than what we are privileged to grow up with in the Western world. And the issues of, you know, feminist issues in the United States, they're important, but they're not as important as they are in the Middle East because they're not as severe. There aren't as many problems. And so I've become much more vocal uh, about those issues, whereas I might not have been if I was in the U.S. And other issues, too, civil liberties and, and basic uh, liberal values are things that I think I speak about more and I care about more because I'm in a region where it's like not at all common, you know, yeah. it's a, not understood very well. So you're actually probably the number one, I guess, journalist and you're an influencer online as well, who, like in Israel, who's speaking on, <clears throat> sorry, on behalf of the voice of the unheard in Iran, right? Like that's, you're probably like the most recognized person in Israel for that today. I mean, according to the Iranian regime, yes. Right, because you're, <laughs> you're working for the Mossad, right? Yeah. <laughs> they, they First they said I was working for the Mossad, and then they said I was head of the Iran desk. So not only do I work for Mossad, but I got promoted. Oh. Now the only question is, where's my paycheck? Oh, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, like, what? Okay. Here's the question. It's a difficult question, and it might actually be a little bit of a cynical one. I can fully understand why any woman would feel passionate about supporting women's rights in Iran. Like we, the whole world, we see what's going on there. It's awful. It's and it's not only women, right? It's it's all of them. But here's where someone could argue, and they and they could argue, and here this is what I want to ask you honestly: Is choosing Iran as a place to promote your activism for women's rights? Is there an underlying reason because obviously helping destroy the like the regime would would help Israel so mm -hmm. so is, is there like is, ulterior motives yeah I guess ulterior yeah. motives is, is the right way to put it like in a good way right it's, it's not like yeah no I understand I understand them. what you mean <clears throat> I've actually had tougher questions like okay. how can you advocate for Iranian women when there are human rights violations in Israel and I'm like what yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the fact that there may be human rights violations somewhere else means I can't talk about exactly. But whatever. It's like when there's um, I, I get this a lot. Like for example, there was uh, a few years back there was a big terrorist attack in Paris, and I put up something like you know we support Paris, blah 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 blah, and then people were like, two days ago there was a terrorist attack in wherever wherever. Why did you not put anything up about that? I'm like just because I didn't put anything up doesn't mean I don't condemn that as well. You yeah. know? <laughs> It's very difficult. The activism space, especially online, is difficult because there's always someone who's unhappy. You're not talking about something. Right, right. Like, you can't say everything. Right, right, <laughs> I'm right, sorry. Right. Um, but in regards to the women's issues in Iran, um, it's actually not exclusive to Iran. I also speak a lot about Afghanistan for many years, even prior to the, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. I spoke about those issues. Iran, I've been speaking about for many years. It's just as a result of the whole women, life, freedom movement that it's come more to the forefront. And also in the international media, people are speaking about it more. Uh, in terms of, you know, whether or not it helps Israel, uh, I don't view it that way. Because if the regime falls, it helps n the entire region. Um, if we're talking about numbers, it actually helps the Arab world more than it helps Israel. Because the regime itself are the biggest murderer of Arab Muslims mm -hmm. in the Middle East. Not Israel. And I think a lot of people don't realize that the people who are most attacked by this Iranian regime are Arab Muslims. Those are the majority of the people that they're that they're actually killing. The operations that they're financing from terrorist organizations like Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, Hamas, that's where most of that money is going. And by the way, also to the persecution of Palestinians right. under Hamas. Right. So these aren't things you hear 
that are spoken about a lot in the in the international media. So, I mean, is there ulterior motives? Yes, in the sense that it's better for the entire world, literally, if this regime falls. And that's one of the reasons that I've advocated so much for regime change in Iran. Based on the, the demands of the people that I'm speaking to on the ground in Iran, you know, I'm not Persian and I'm not an Iranian citizen, and I'm not going to tell them what their government should be or who should rule it. But I can advocate based on what they're saying they want. And what they want is very, very clear. They want a regime change. They don't want to be under the mullahs anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I respect that. And I think that should be amplified, especially when you're dealing with a, a government that literally cuts off the internet. Yeah. I mean, almost every day there's there's internet outages now in Iran uh, as sort of a preemptive measure, because they know there are going to be a lot of protests this, uh, this month and the one-year anniversary of Masa Amini's uh, death. Yes. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about that, because you actually reached out to me and asked me to take part in, in a campaign, right? So tell us a little yeah. bit about this campaign. So, well, first of all, there's a lot of different activities in, in Israel. I mean, I think in general, when we talk about the Israeli society and Israeli history, it's actually very common. Uh, there's a lot in common with, uh, with Persians, uh, both historically and today. Uh, so it's a logical allyship, even though from the Western perspective, you wouldn't think so based on how it's spoken about. But I think there's a lot more cultural... Um, and, you know, family values that are similar between Iranians and Israelis than even Americans and Israelis. And I think a lot of, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of the younger, even Israeli generation doesn't know that up until 1979, like, we sold them fighter jets. Yep. And we could travel there and they could travel here and we had like full diplomatic relations. Like I think it, yeah. younger generations don't even know that probably. Yeah. And Iran was actually one of the first Muslim, the second Muslim country to recognize Israel, which is crazy if you right. think about. Right. Um, so it was a very different reality prior to prior to 79. And even like ancient history, you know, speaking about the relationship between the Jews and Iran, you know, with Cyrus the Great, who allowed the Jews to return here. So there's right. a lot of history. Queen Esther. Yes, and Queen <laughs> Esther, of course. Right, right. Of course. Right. So there's a lot of history there that people don't know about. Um, and I wanted to do this uh, campaign. It's like the hashtag Israelis love Iranians. Uh, Because I want to show Iranians on the ground, but also the world in whatever language, Hebrew, Arabic, Persian, I don't care, um, that the people of Israel across different communities and across different cultures within Israel do support the people of Iran. And I think it's really powerful for them because what they are taught from infancy is that, you know, Israel is the little Satan, America is the great Satan, Israel needs to be destroyed. So the Iranians that I'm speaking to on the ground, you know, they've told me, uh, actually all of them that I've spoken to about it have told me how they grew up and they grew up with, uh, with Israeli flags painted outside their school. And I mean like kindergarten, like from, from childhood, they have rallies that they're forced to attend to celebrate the regime. I don't know if you've seen, but even during this last wave of protests over the last year, there were schoolgirls who refused to sing like songs of allegiance to the IRGC who were arrested, children who were arrested for, for acts like this, not for acts of violence or something like that, but for refusing to like pledge allegiance right. to the or, Iranian regime. Or for wishing Bibi Netanyahu to uh, uh, recovery, right? Yeah, yeah, that right. also happened. I, I mean, everything related to Israel, like they're just irrational about. Right. Just last week, there was a weightlifter, an Iranian weightlifter, who shook hands with an Israeli at a, at a competition. And now he's been banned for life from all sport venues in the country of Iran. I mean, it's just... It's just madness how how obsessive they are and 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 it's irrational. And the thing is the international community, and this is one of the things that i that I focus on a lot, the international community doesn't really hold them accountable. right. And I don't mean like, oh, go invade Iran and overthrow the regime. That's not at all what I'm saying. But there are steps that can be taken on the level of the EU, on the level of the United States, to hold the regime accountable. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is the opposite. And it's funny because I think the two societies that really understand the mentality of the Iranian regime are this one in Israel and the Iranian people themselves. And nobody else understands it at that level, even in the, even in the West. Oh, Obama didn't get it, that's for sure. <laughs> and Biden doesn't now. I mean, now he's talking about releasing $18 billion, a total of $18 billion to the regime. I mean, where is that going to go? And the sad reality is it's probably 
not going to directly impact Americans on the ground, I hope, I hope, but we know for sure it will impact Israelis, it will impact Palestinians, and it will impact everybody else in the Middle East. Right. You, for, so for, for those of you who don't know, you're also engaged. Yes, I am engaged. <laughs> Been engaged for a while, but planning a wedding is hard work. Right? So. <laughs> so I, I have some questions. <clears throat> So you're engaged uh, to a man named uh, Yasser Khadad. Yes. So I'm assuming a lot of uh, my listener, my the listeners and the viewers probably know who he is. Um, he's been a lot in the spotlight recently, also. Um, so he's also an activist. Yes. And um, he's a Christian Arab, correct? Correct. Yep. And uh, f- first of all, I lo- like I love you guys are like this power couple. I love the videos you guys do together. By the way, I love them. <laughs> You haven't done you haven't done recently. Uh, we actually have one coming this month okay, about Iran, about the situation okay, with good, Iran. Good. Yeah, um, I'm curious to know. I mean, why you fell in love with him and the fact that you have so much in common. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, also weird. It's so, very weird to like come to another country to restart your life in a different place, a different culture, and then find someone you have so much in common with. Right. right. Absolutely. <laughs> I think this is the part that still, even, you know, years later, we've been together over three years now. And um, this is the part that's very like shocking to me even right. now. So um, I think what's surprising is as a, J- a young Jewish woman who decides to make Aliyah to Israel... And ends up deciding to get married to a non-Jew in Israel. It's interesting because I think a lot of, um, I don't know if if the Israeli listeners listening here will understand, but a lot of like, a lot of young women who do choose to make Aliyah to Israel, a, a lot of that is because in the back of their mind, they want to find like a nice Jewish husband, right? Did you want to find a nice Jewish husband <laughs> and then find a nice Christian Arab husband? Like, uh, I don't know that I thought that much. Like, I wasn't really looking for a relationship or or anything when I came here at you know twenty two. Uh, but that's the way it worked out. My mom did say to me, she's like, how did you manage to do that? Because not only is Yosef like from the Arab community, but he's a minority within the Arab community as well. And then, you know, cut that population in half and then cut that in half again by the, by the men who aren't married. (laughs) So it is, it is kind of remarkable, but I, I think one of the funniest things is when we first met and I, we knew, I knew of him from other activism circles. I didn't like know him personally. And we met because I actually used to do like a happy hour get together with different uh, activists. And I invited him because as I mentioned, I have a digital marketing company and I wanted his Amuta as a, as a client. (laughs) <laughs> so that was the reason that I initially reached out. And now I do things for free for him. How does that work? Right. <laughs> so, and you weren't like, like secretly interested? Like there was no interest? Honestly, no. Because no, no. I didn't know him. Like I'd never met him in person. Um, so I, I didn't, uh, I didn't have any, and as I said, like I wasn't really looking for a relationship or anything, but when I first, I very first met him, I actually thought he was into one of my friends at first. Cause we were in a big group of people in a social setting. And when I left with my friends, my friend was like, Oh, he's not really my type, but all my friends who were walking with me turned to me and were like, but he's your type. <laughs> That's I was amazing. like, oh, no. That's amazing. But that's how it worked that's out. That's amazing. So, yeah. So um, so I actually heard a podcast when he was on, uh, he was on Ben Mimble's podcast. Yes. And so I was super interested to listen to that. Um, I'm actually going to be interviewed to Ben Ben Bo also soon. So I was like interested, first of all, in hearing like other people's interviews first. But then when I saw Yosef Khadad, like I love him. I'm sorry. I know he's your fiance, but I <laughs> love him as well. And I was like, I need to listen to it. It was super interesting. And one of the things he said there was he mentioned a, did you hear the episode? Did you Part of it? it. Yeah. It was like two hours. Right, it's yeah, really it's long, long. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he, he mentioned that you were invited to speak somewhere in Europe and you found out after that it was actually the the, the regime trying to... Yeah. 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 So this has... Ha- I've gotten a lot of threats from Iran. A lot. Um, also a lot of just like general harassment on social media. I mean, one of the things that the regime in Iran does is like they will manipulate social media with fake accounts, but not like one or two, like en masse, thousands. So a lot of the comments that you see when you see 
pro, you know, Israel-Iran relations, for example, sometimes there'll be comments like on Twitter in Persian and in English occasionally, uh, you know, insulting and accusing Israel of all manner of conspiracies. Usually these are IRGC um, accounts that they that they manage and they have certain people that they target. Of course, I'm one of them because I've been, uh, you know, followed by a lot of Iranians. So I guess I have uh, more impact there. But it's definitely happened to me with threats, and I did get an invitation to uh, to speak at a conference about women's issues in um, Europe uh, towards, I think it was October or November, not long after the, the big protest started in Iran. And I thought it was kind of strange because it wasn't related to Israel specifically, and I had no relation, but it might happen. It happens occasionally. I get asked to speak at events like this. And they sent me, you know, like a professional looking uh, pamphlet and they sent a bunch of photos from last year's conference. And so I said, you know, I'll think about it and I'll get back to you. I called the university that they said the conference was being held at the next day. And they said, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't have a conference like that. And I said, well, did you have a conference last year? And they said, no. Wow. <laughs> oh, my God. And so I said, wait, so do you have someone by this name that reached out to me from an official email of the university? And they were like, no, we don't have that. <laughs> So, of course, I reported it, um, but it, it's known, you know, this is something the Iranian regime has done as well to other Israelis, other academics. They've tried to get them to come to conferences or to events in order to, to kidnap you? either to kidnap or to kill. I mean, we don't know exactly oh my what their plan was, but yeah, I mean, this also happened to um, one of the, the CEO of uh, Alma. It's another think tank uh, here in Israel. So they did the same thing to her. They tried to to lure her to a, a conference to speak at something. So it's it's a known thing that they're doing. And also right now, because they're facing a lot of pressure and uh, attention for their human rights violations. So and also, of course, the conflict in Syria with Israel and their proxy war with Israel. They're very much targeting Israelis. Wow. Very, very much. I mean, I'm sure you saw Shabak just a few days ago warned that especially during the Hagim, Jewish communities and Jews and especially Israelis abroad are a target. Yes. So now I, I have to be very, very careful. Um, you know, whenever I'm in Europe, I don't say where I am until after. I don't post things until after. Okay. So it's a, it's slightly different in, in how I approach it. But, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't change anything because... I am actually very privileged that I live in Israel and that I have a country that's serious about Iran and about protecting its citizens. And um, other Iranians don't have that. Even Iranians in the diaspora, you know, it's great that they live in the United States, but the truth is that everybody who has family in Iran is still a target. And they have. They have targeted Iranians who speak out against the regime abroad. They have tried to kid—they have kidnapped them. Uh, they've tried to assassinate them. And they call them, they harass them, they'll arrest their family. So in a way, I'm blessed because I don't have family in Iran and I don't have anything to lose right. and I'm not scared of them. So they can't do anything right. to shut me up. So so while you're being, it's, it's crazy though to think about it, like the two of you as a couple, like you're being targeted by Iranians and he's being targeted by Israelis like on on flights from yeah Dubai, are we the right? most hated or the most loved couple I don't know it's cra- it's, <laughs> it's, so something that I found very surprising maybe today maybe not as much because I understand it and especially since following you online I kind of get the big picture a little bit more but when I started to become um, more so I was I was at, like an activist on my campus but then you know I made Aliyah blah 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 so ended up getting into makeup doing other things but then uh, a few years ago, I got back into the the advocacy, and especially because I felt like I had these platforms now to do it. Um, and when I started doing it in English, I started to see the followers from countries like Iran go up. I don't see them. It's interesting. I don't. I don't see because I guess it's probably not in the top five countries. So I don't see them there. But I see them like by they're very they're very active in the DMs. Very, very, very active. And so I have like... They love social media, which right? is crazy because like half of it's banned in Iran. But Iranians love social media, especially Instagram. Right, <laughs> right. So I, I have a few that like I'm kind of in contact with. Like we'll chat back and forth and and they'll write to me things like, my friend was killed today. Please help us get this news out and whatever. 
And I've actually spoken to people that I know at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to ask them, like, do you think these people are real? Do you think that possibly it's the regime trying to reach out to somebody like me? Like, you know, how... So, so you believe that these are real people, right? That are that are. Te- I mean, there's no way to know that like everyone that I've spoken to is real, <laughs> of course. And I expect that probably some of the messages I receive are people trying to get at something or get information. Um, we know that that's one of the ways that they operate. But in terms of like stories that I've um, reported on or that I've received, of course, there's for every uh, article that I've written about Iran or posts that I've made about Iran, there's a hundred more messages I received that I can't verify. Um, so there's there's really no way to know. I know that I do get a lot of information and also because like I have to have a certain standard in order to publish it for like as a journalist. So sometimes I will have to like confirm through another person that they knew who was there or someone else has photos. So I have had to like even question people who are sharing with me. But I think that there's a lot of understanding amongst the Iranians that like, it's not coming from a place where I doubt you. It's coming from a place where we need to be able to show the world that this is actually the case. Um, and, and so like, if I'm able to show that these, that these stories that they're experiencing are actually true, then, then I do, of course. And I think that there's enough evidence from enough different sources of these systemic human rights violations that it's pretty reasonable to believe most of the stories. That being said, obviously, I can't report on something that I can't right. somehow verify, uh, which does make it more difficult. Even in the case of Masa Amini, I spoke to someone who was in the uh, van of the morality police with her, who had a very detailed, long uh, testimony about what happened to her, about what was said at what points, very, very detailed, but I can't prove it. So I wasn't able to to write about it because there's just no way to confirm. And obviously, when it comes to Iran, as opposed to writing an article about something that happened in the United States, you can get a statement from the police. Well, I can't get a statement from the morality police, nor do I want to in Iran because they would just lie. Right. Um, so it's harder to to prove things journalistically. But you actually do have other organizations, even organizations that are anti-Israel, you know, <laughs> Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International um, they are working on the issues uh, of Iran, and they do have reports that are examining this, including with people on the ground. Um, so in that regard, I appreciate that perhaps not of those specific organizations, right. but of many human rights organizations on the ground who are monitoring this so, uh, activity. So if you already brought up these other organizations, so if we look in the big picture, so we can both agree, and I think pretty much everyone listening can agree, Iran is a human right, rights violator. We are not as much as the world thinks. And yet the world, like the world, these organizations are obsessed with us, right? Yeah. If we look um, as somebody who, who follows what these organizations do, because I don't, you, you probably do a lot more. Are they more obsessed with Israel than they are with Iran even right yes. now? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that like for someone who cares about human rights issues globally and who talks about a lot of these issues and, and writes about them as a journalist, it's very, very frustrating, not just as an Israeli, but as a journalist to see organizations that frankly are credible on other issues be so blatantly biased when it comes to Israel and honestly intellectually lazy when it comes to like looking at the actual facts and the situation and speaking to the people on both sides. It's just laziness. I I mean, I read that entire report about how Israel was apartheid. That's not like their other reports, not in the language, not in the tone, not in the approach. There's nothing about that that is representative of the other work of Amnesty International or, or of Human Rights Watch, for example. And that's really frustrating. It's frustrating because I think Israel has challenges like every other country. And I always say this about organizations like Breaking the Silence, Abed Salem. The principle of these organizations is necessary and just. It's good to have people monitoring the military or monitoring activities and complex uh, territorial debates like we have with Judea and Samaria, West Bank. But at the same time, they're they're unfair. <laughs> They're unfair in their approach, and they they don't actually resolve the problem. They they tap into the propaganda side instead. Right. They'll go whine about Israel in the EU instead of actually dealing with the Israeli government and holding whoever accountable who actually maybe committed a crime. 
Right. They, in fact, I know that in the case of Breaking the Silence, they've refused to work with military prosecutors. How can you say that you're monitoring and advancing human rights when you're not even working with the people who want to hold a, you know, a specific soldier and a specific incident accountable? Wow. So it's just, it's unfortunate. It's, it's insulting as an Israeli, but it's also insulting as someone who cares about human rights that you can't actually get to the issues where there are issues because they're so busy propagandizing. So, you know? so, so organizations like that, like the Shovrim Shtika, is it, is it like, like you said, like you support the underlying, like the... the the, the, the general cause for organizations like, like this you support. Yeah, really. watchdog organizations, of course right. I support. How could I not? So do you think an organization like this is just like... I don't think they're do- that's what they're doing. Are they self-hating Jews? Like, is that what it is? I mean, I don't know. I can't speak to like the individuals within the organizations because I don't know them personally. But the result of what they're doing is, yeah, it's contributing to un- unfair criticism of Israel because they're not presenting the truth about even what the problems in Israel are. They are exaggerating. They're disproportionately focusing on certain things while de-emphasizing other things. They take things out of context. And there's a lot of things that they have done. I mean, I remember there was a, they even did like a speaking tour on campuses. Why are you speaking on campuses? Your job is to act as a watchdog to hold, you know, uh, for example, the IDF accountable for their activities. What does that have to do with with speaking about Israel on a on a university campus where people are not Israeli citizens who do not and have not served in the Israeli military? They're not lawyers. There's no reason. None. You know, pure propaganda. It 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 reminds me of like some things that I've seen over the past year um, in regards to uh, the judicial reform that have made me really angry. Like, for example, when, um, you know, the, the high-tech guys, right, they were talking about the reform and, and protesting. So I think they have full right to protest here in Israel. And I think they have full right to, to say that they're worried about, <clears throat> about the future of these industries. But when I see them on CNN talking to the world about how basically they're, af- like they see that everyone's going to start pulling investments out of Israel. Don't you see how that's only harming your industry, like the entire country and our, and our economy, but it, you're actually hurting yourself. Like why go tell your foreign investors that you're worried about foreign investment in your country? Like why? Like do it here. Okay. No problem. Yeah. But like, and I think that's, I don't know. It's, it's like an Israeli thing to feel that if we're doing it out in the world, that it actually means something. And as I guess both of us understand as Jews who come from the world, it's like, no, 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 no. You're only making Israel look bad. Like, and that's not, like you said, like that's not what the purpose of an organization like Shavrim Shtika is supposed to be. It's supposed to be human rights, right? And to make sure that, uh, that the military is doing, you know, things accordingly, but not to make Israel look bad just because that, and it feels like that just because they get money from the European Union. Right, right. <laughs> oh, it's, it's frustrating. It's super yeah. interesting, it's, but, it's, but it's very frustrating. Yeah, it's difficult to talk about the challenges that Israel faces objectively in the international sphere. I mean, I think it's definitely different what I would say to other Israelis versus what I would say internationally. Um, and I try to be as authentic about that as possible. I'm, I'm never going to be a person who's like, yes, everything the Israeli government does is great, no matter who's in the government. Right. Um, but at the same time, like there's a way to speak about it in context that doesn't contribute to the illegitimate criticism of Israel. And yeah, it's very difficult um, for someone who is born in Israel and grew up in Israel. It's very difficult if you haven't lived abroad and seen how other people view Israel to communicate about the problems in Israel because there is an anti-Semitic element to it that you might not have ever experienced right. if you only grew up in Israel. Absolutely. I can say that even for me, I grew up in like a, like I went to Jewish school. So until high school, I didn't really know many non-Jews. Like I did from soccer, from hockey, whatever. But um, it, it was, I, I honestly grew up believing that there is no anti-Semitism in Canada. And it was only once I hit university that I realized oh like there's like it's not even in not even in relation to Israel like I literally had my throughs my shoes thrown out a window because I in like orientation week I told somebody that the people were talking about like what languages they speak 
And I was like, yeah, I know English. I know French, obviously. And I I know, like, Hebrew. My parents speak Romanian as well. And the guy was like, the guy was, it was his room. He was like, whoa, whoa, wait, you know Hebrew? Why do you know Hebrew? And I was like, well, like, I'm Jewish. And I went to Jewish day school. And he took my shoes and he threw them out the window. And he said, get the f*** out of my room, you f***. Wow. And I was like, what's that kike? You know, like, yeah, that, that not, not aware. Yeah, I didn't even know, like, yeah. what is that word? Like, I didn't even know what that word. And everybody in the room was like silent, you know, and nobody knew what to do. And I, and I was just, I didn't even. Wow, no one even said anything? No one said anything, but I did have people come to me after they saw me on campus and they were like, I'm really sorry I didn't do something. But everybody was in shock. I, I get it. You know, I yeah, yeah. Them. like you're in shock. But I honestly, I didn't, I didn't make the. I didn't understand until later when I like went home and Googled like, what's a kike? Like, why did yeah. I even get kicked out of that room? I didn't even get it. And um, that's just one example. But but anti-Semitism exists. And I think for, even for a lot of Jews who, you know, live within Jewish communities, they think it Well, I think for years we thought it, it didn't really exist anymore in North America. I think recently we've been seeing, you know, like especially um, communities, for example, the black community that always really supported the Jewish community in the United States is not as not as supportive, and so I think Jews in the U- U.S. are starting to wake up to the fact that anti-Semitism still exists. Yeah, I mean, anti-Semitism in the U.S. has skyrocketed. Like in the time since I left I- uh, the United States to come to Israel, and now, like looking back at what's going on, it's shocking. Yeah, it's shocking even to me, who who works in this space and is very familiar with anti-Semitism issues. I've never seen it this bad. Right. Right. It's really, really scary. And what's interesting is like, uh, as someone who comes from like a mixed background, like I have one parent who's Christian and one parent who's oh, okay. who's Jewish. It's still, I'm still a target for anti-Semitism. It doesn't matter how I identify or what I say. Like it's always a part of who I am. And, and to someone who holds anti-Semitic beliefs, that's what they focus on. Right. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, so... I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyways. When one day, inshallah, there is no more uh, Islamic uh, crazy Michigan regime um, and Israelis have uh, can go visit Iran. Is that like the first place you're going? Obviously. Iran's been at the top of my list for many, many years. And now, now that I'm like known in Iran... I'm, I'm kind of regretting that I didn't go, like, maybe before I made Aliyah just to visit on a... I know they're not good with America either, but I probably could have gotten away with it yeah. <laughs> before. Can, yeah. Now, not so much. Um, but I hope that one day I can uh, I can visit that and actually also Beirut. Those are the two places, yeah. like, I'd love to go. Beirut, love. totally, totally. Yeah. It's like Tel Aviv, I feel. like. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's what everybody says. Yeah. My sister's been there quite a bit. Okay, so obviously everyone here who's listening and watching and especially reached this point of the video um, or of the podcast uh, supports the people of Iran. What, you know, even if they don't have a huge following online or whatever, what can the everyday person here in Israel do to show their support for the people of Iran? Yeah, so I mean, throughout the month of September, there are several events that uh, have already taken place and will take place. There are several murals that are being unveiled in Haif, two in Haifa, one in Jerusalem, and one in Tel Aviv. Uh, you can see my social media if you want to see like the exact dates and times for that. I will be sharing it. Uh, but in addition to that, we're doing what I reached out to you about the Israelis Love Iranians campaign, and it's a pretty low bar for participating. We're just encouraging any uh, Israelis or even from the Jewish community, you don't have to be an Israeli citizen to share a post about supporting the protesters in Iran. Uh, We expect that it will be like a very, very big protest throughout the month of September because it is the one-year anniversary of the the killing of Masa Amini. Uh, So if we can show through social media by using this hashtag that Israelis don't have a problem with Iranians, that we want relations, that we want peace, because frankly, that's also the message I've gotten from Iranians uh, in my DMs and in my comments. So if we can show that to them, then that alone is disproving 44 years of what the regime has told them. And that's very powerful uh, to them as individuals. It motivates them and helps them feel uh, that someone has their back, which they don't feel right now. And it also shows the world that it's not as the media maybe frames it. It's not Israel against Iran or the Israeli people against the Iranian people. Nobody, including our government, has a problem with the Iranian people. In fact, the opposite. We want peace with them. We want relations. And I think that's what the world needs to know. Right. Absolutely. So I'm definitely going to take part. I'm trying to think of like something good 
you know, I don't, I don't want to just put up just a like random picture. I'm trying to think of something good. So maybe <laughs> after when we close, if you have like an idea, we'll brainstorm. Me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm definitely going to take part, and and I really do encourage um, whoever's here with us at this point to to take part because I do believe that um, I, I I believe in in people to people diplomacy a hundred percent. I had the op- I was so lucky to have the opportunity to go to Morocco. Um, last year and I'm going this month actually oh, I love yeah, Morocco yeah, yeah. I was there a few years ago it's gorgeous I love the people of Morocco I love them and I had really the opportunity in the um, in the airport there were a whole bunch of young Moroccans that uh, one of the guys I was with, he had a keep on his head. And we, we, he, when we walked in, they started singing to us, uh, Palestine, Palestine, whatever, Palestine, Palestine. And, and we, you know, there was that moment where we were kind of scared, you know, maybe something would happen, like violent. But then, and I was with guys. And guys, you know, and we're smarter, you know. We know how to handle <laughs> things, right? Guys, it automatically, like, it escalates into, like, trash talk, violence, Arguments, whatever, right, yeah. right, whatever. I was like, I, I got this. I got this. I walked to, I walk up to them and I'm like, you, you know, you know, Palestine. I, yeah, I'm from Palestine. <laughs> the guys were like looking at me like, what? what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Israel, Palestine, same thing. You know, I'm from, I'm, I'm, I'm Palestinian. And they were like, what? And I was like, and, and then someone said to me something, Al-Aqsa or something. I was like, you want to go? I can take you. I was like, but I have to wait outside. Yeah, I actually I was, can't. Right. I was, you can go. Right. I was, I was like, you're Muslim, right? And he was like, yeah. I was like, come to Israel. I'll take you to I'll take you to Alexa. It's not in danger. You can go. I'll wait for you outside. And he looks at me and he was like, I can't go there. And I was like, Yes, you can. We have diplomatic relations. Like you just have to pay, I don't know how much, get a visa, come to Israel, I'll take you. Yeah. And the guys were like in shock. Anyways, make a long story short, by the end of this like 30 minute conversation, we're taking selfies, they're tagging me on Instagram, they're following me. They're, they're sending me off to my flight going, bye, Israel. Say hello. We love you, Israel. That's amazing. And, 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 <laughs> and, and, and like my entire trip to Morocco, I felt like it was amazing and all that. But like that was that one moment where I was like, I made a difference, you know? Yeah. And, and, and so I totally believe in like these people to people opportunities. And if we don't have the ability to physically meet with these people from Iran, social media is probably the best way that we could do it today. So I totally Absolutely. support everything you're doing. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. This was super interesting for me. Thank you. I apologize. It's all in English. but I know. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. You have to start learning English a little bit. When you sit here and look at it, זה מה שחשוב. ואת, גברת, צריכה להתחיל ללמוד עברית. אני מדברת עברית, אני פשוט, זה יותר קשה להסביר כל הקמפיינים והעילות שלי. וערבית? ערבית לא. לא? הוא לא מלמד אותך ערבית? כמה מילים. אוקיי. אבל זהו. זהו? כן. ופרסי? Farsi, yeah, a, a little bit. A little bit. Uh, Arabic and Farsi, both I can read. Oh. But I read very, very slowly. I know one thing in Farsi. I hope I'm still saying it right. I remember it from high school because obviously the Iranian community is beside the Jewish community. We yeah. always live together, right? Do said daram, is that right? Did I say it right? I love you. No idea. I, I love I, you. Who knows? All right. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of pronunciation, I'm, I'm not the person to ask. So... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, good luck with everything that you're doing. Uh, thank you. Thank and it's wonderful. And it's wonderful that we have people like you in the world, uh, but especially in Israel, especially thank supporting you. us. Thank you. And you as well. Thank you. Um, טוב, אז תודה רבה. אנחנו uh, ניפגש uh, בשבוע הבא כמובן ביום ראשון לעוד פרק של החיים היפים. Uh, היה לי סופר מעניין. אם אהבתם, לא לשכוח לשתף, תספרו לחברים. זה באמת היה פרק מרתק, מעניין, ואני חושבת שכולם צריכים לשמוע אותו. אז תודה רבה ושבוע טוב. ביי. <laughs>